We got our wallaby gear. Most people go to the gym for exercise, but here at the Australian Reptile Park, we catch yellow-footed rock wallabies. This colony is due for their routine health check, but believe me, there's nothing routine about catching these agile marsupials. We got all the gear? Yeah, yeah. We got all the gear. Good. Let's get into it. Might just have a bit of a chat about how we're going to do it first. We'll probably all have the opportunity to catch one of the yellowfoots. If it doesn't go to plan and a roo gets out, or you know, you miss, it doesn't matter. Just let's settle, look at where we are, make sure the roos are safe. So our target is that little guy sitting right there. So that's getting to a size where we're risking mating with siblings. Cannot have that. All right, let's go and set up and catch these roos. Mating with siblings can cause serious genetic defects. Protecting bloodlines is a vital part of their captive management, and that's why we need to catch and microchip the joeys. Yellowfoots are perfectly designed for hopping along rock faces and cliffs. They've got long feet and a strong tail for balance. We don't stand a chance of catching them up there. OK, so let's use this corner. Let's use the angle. We'll just skirt those rocks there, and that way we'll push roos around right into this corner. You'll be coming in and catching your kangaroo right there. So what the guys are doing here is making a, a netting line. So what that enables us to do is bring the wallabies around the yard. Once they hit that netting, they're forced into a corner. We'll pick one or two wallabies at a time, that's all. It's safe for them, safe for us, and then we go in and catch. But with yellowfoot rock wallabies, nothing's easy. They can jump three or four metres straight up. We don't want one outside. How fast are they? Well, they're like bullets, and the only way to catch them is by their tail or with a net. Now, that doesn't hurt them at all. I just hope our reflexes are quick enough. This is a big operation. There's five keepers just to catch six wallabies. They're not easy. All right, with the netting set up, it's time to put this plan into action. OK, let's come around in a line. That's it, let's stay together. We've got two over here. OK, we've got two in, Drew. Hold that one there, mate. Just missed him. Okay, here they come. Okay, we've got one down. That one jumped straight over me. They're hard. That's him. Ooh. It's okay, let him go. Well, it looks like things aren't exactly going to plan. We've had to call in another two keepers. Reinforcements, the wallabies, giving us a hard time. Yes, come in, guys. We've got one here. One right here. Close in. Andrew, come in. Here we go. Got him. Watch your leg. Easy, Drew. Easy. Well done, mate. Hey. Are you all right, mate? Yeah, all good. <laughs> Thought you were a rock. Good on you. Well done, mate. Yeah, cheers. Putting the yellow foots in sacks is like putting them in mum's pouch. It's dark, comfortable, and won't stress them out. Um, okay, next one, guys. Same again. Come on. Come on. That's it, he's down. I'm in behind you, Drew. Oh. Beat us all. <laughs> we got one. We caught one in the net. Missed the corner. One, two, three. Where is he? Keep up, keep the line. Got him. Nice catch, Caroline. Okay, good on ya. Three down, three to go. We've managed to pick a few off. They're not easy. The guys are doing really well. Two in net and one by hand. He's in here, so just... Um, Let's hold back. Someone should support me a little bit more here. Just let me see if I can grab tail, I can. Oh. Got him. Whoa. OK. Whoa, what a catch. I think that deserves a replay. Oh. Got him. Whoa. OK. Oop. Full of fire. One, two, three. I just managed to grab that little one by the tail. The reflexes were good. And that's how it happens sometimes. You set up a plan, 
We've got a good crèche there, but we caught more of the wallabies opportunistically around the edges. You've got to take your opportunities. This is Tasman Island. It lies just off the southeastern tip of Tasmania, and it's a haven for wildlife. South of here is the Southern Ocean, a wild place where only the hardiest of animals and craziest of sailors venture. I'm heading out with Rob Pennicott, who runs wilderness cruises along the coast. Rob knows the waters around here better than most. He used to be a fisherman, but today he shows tourists the marvels of this spectacular coastline. This cave was formed over millions of years of wind and wave action, eating away at a weak point in the rock. That's scary. We're right in the cave. A big surge comes through like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. The cave's just massive. This is exhilarating stuff. Being able to get so close to the action like this is pretty special. Over there is the majestic Tasman Island. But there's one thing Rob wants to show me before we head out. The cliffs down here are staggering. At just over 300 metres, this is the highest sea cliff in the whole southern hemisphere. Their shape and structure is just amazing. The rock itself is Jurassic Dolerite, formed 165 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Now it's time to venture offshore. First stop, Tasman Island. It's of particular interest to Rob. He helped fund a Tasmania Parks and Wildlife Initiative to eradicate a certain feral pest from the island. It sits 500 metres off the Tasman Peninsula, and it's home to short-tailed shearwaters, sooty shearwaters, as well as fairy prions. The island's problem stems from its position. There was no GPS a century ago, so the best way of alerting ships to this massive rock was to put a lighthouse on top of it. That eventually became fully automated, but the lighthouse keepers left behind their cats. And they've gone on to become an established pest. So a few years back, Tasmania Parks and Wildlife set about eradicating the cats. The cats do have a place in Australia, and that's at someone's home as a pet, but not in the Australian environments, and especially not on a small island like that. They will eradicate every possible food source, and in this case, it's seabirds. Eventually, after a couple of years of research, the team were able to step into action. We had traps that we let cats come in and get very accustomed to yes. the traps. We did baits without poison, so yes. they got accustomed to eating that. And then one day, the poison was added. Then we got all bar eight cats on the yes. first night. And then in the next week, we got the last eight. Monitoring with specially trained cat detection dogs, camera traps, and good old fashioned leg work looking for evidence of cats continues to this day. And so what's happened? The cats are gone and you see an immediate response? That's right, it's quite incredible, compounding each year where it used to be this deep in dead birds with eggs in, yes. caves full of cats taking the birds. Yep. Now the fledglings are just all inside the caves yes. and in all the crevices. It's fantastic. In fact, today, the bird population is going through the roof on Tasman as populations appear to be having increased breeding success. A visit to the tropics in Queensland wouldn't be complete without an encounter with a certain scaly reptile. Up here is a scrub python. It's Australia's longest python. Right over my head, and he's quick. This is a fruit tree. And it's pretty common to find them in fruit trees, 
because this is where you get fruit bats. And he'll sit in here through the day. Now, he's not doing much through the daytime, just staying cool in the shade here. When it gets dark, bang, snake's got to feed. And being a python, and I can see it here, there's big heat-sensing pits along the top and bottom lips. And it's a constrictor. Young scrub pythons get big enough, well, maybe to kill a man, certainly a kid. And they get big because of the food they eat. Obviously, this one's eating bats, but they're known to eat wallabies, good-sized wallabies. They swallow it whole. They constrict it. Each time it breathes out, squeezes tighter until there's no breath left. He's looking down at me. He's just in the shade there. It's important for a big snake like this to stay cool through the middle of the day, not to warm up. That big body, if it gets too much sun, will overheat. And pretty strictly nocturnal. And this scrub, he's a smart one. He's here for an easy meal. OK, he's on the move. And I'm going to leave him right there. I don't want to disturb him too much. And that big head looking down at me. I don't want to go near that either. Unfortunately, the most common encounter people have with scrubbies is with the flat and lifeless kind. Lucky for this one, my eyes are peeled. I don't want to add to the numbers. I've just pulled over. This is a scrub python. That's in a bit of a dangerous situation because it's in the middle of the road. And you know, as big as that looks, it's only probably one year old. This is the longest Australian snake. Hello, mate. It's a bit of a cool night, but that tongue's flicking. It's out on the hunt. There's a heap of possums running around here. Now, I couldn't eat a big one just yet, but it certainly would take a small one. Oh, scrub pythons. They're cranky. This is a baby, but it's still having a strip. Oh, another one. Look at that. I'm too big for you, mate. Hey, don't you bite me, please. And again, that mouth opens. That's a big gape. That's only because it feels a bit threatened. My big car's just come past, and I've pulled up now, and now there's a big, warm-blooded mammal. And remember, scrub pythons have got heat sensor pits all around the top and bottom lip, so I'm glowing to that snake. But I'm not going to hurt him. I'm going to pick him up and take him just over there in the bush, where he's safe. Come on, mate. Now, how am I going to get... Hey, that's enough of that. You look that way, please. All right, thank you, mister. Look at that. Settle down, please, buddy. I don't want any bites. Are they Pretty quiet, really. Oh, please. They're pretty gentle snakes. It's just on that road, he feels a bit threatened. Now let's go over to the side there. Whoop, 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 please. And you know something there, have a look at. Scrubbies are arboreal, meaning they mainly live in the tree. This snake's just crossing the road, going from one side to the other. Look at that. From the tip of its tail, it's able to hang off me. And they'll actually feed like that up in a fruit tree. They'll hang there by half their body, waiting for a fruit bat to come in and whack. Then they'll constrict. Oh, no, I don't want that head, please, buddy. There we go. Look at that position. I'm just about to take him off the road, but he's curled right up, ready to strike. It's all right, mate. I'm going to let you go now. All right, I want to get him right off up here in this vine thicket. Come on, mate. All right, mate, there you go. That body's so strong, just got his head on and wrapped around. That supported the rest of the body, and now he, the whole snake's going up the tree. There he is. Well, that's good. I'd much rather him there than squashed on the road. That's it, let's stay together. We've got two over here. Got him! Whoa. At the Australian Reptile Park, my team and I are rounding up yellow-footed rock wallabies for a routine health check. Oh. It's OK. Let him go. They haven't made it easy. Oh. Oh. oh, unlucky, mate. But we're making progress. Drew's got him. Nice, mate. Well done. He was deep in there, hey? That's four down. Two to go. Drew, there's one up there, mate. Nick, I'm going to bring him to you beyond that tree. Ready? Coming. Good catch, mate. Good catch. Got him there. Yeah, I'll grab your net again. Thanks, mate. So far, we've caught five out of six. The only one to go now is the juvenile, but 
It's doing what yellow foot rock wallabies do best, and that's hiding in rock crevices. That's exactly what Mum would have taught it to do. Yellowfoots were nearly hunted to extinction, with several populations being wiped out. Young joeys are so important to the future. We must find this one to ensure that it's happy, healthy, and has its own identity. There he is. Got him, mate? Ah, beautiful. That's it, number six. Look how small he is. So he's only a couple of months out of mum's pouch. Now's the right time for us to give him his own identity. All right. The reason we put them into the sacks is because all marsupials find it comforting to be dark and like they're in a pouch as a joey. So once we put him in there, like now, He's already settled. He'll be like he's back in mum's pouch. All six wallabies have been caught and are sitting comfortably in their sacks. First, we weigh them. 8.95. Then, we scan for the microchip. The microchip is our way of identifying each individual animal. And that's really important because the population is managed genetically. We cannot have relatives breeding with each other. No, I can't find the chip. Um... It's the big boy. I mean, we've got scarring on the tail, and, and, and it's our biggest yeah, yeah, it's male. Yeah. OK, I think we should just rechip. Yep, let's do it. OK. We know this wallaby is our big dominant male, but we can't find its microchip. The scanner's not picking it up. Now, we've searched all over the back and shoulders where the chips are, uh, so the safest thing to do is just to put another microchip in. It's completely painless and only takes a second to put just under the skin. Similar to what a vet would do for your dog or cat. Got him. Yep. Easy as that. This is the best bit, letting them go. Off you go. All right, time to check this guy's partner and mum of our Joey. Ah, uh, this is mum. There it is. Look at that teat. OK, and we've got good milk. Gland looks great. One, two, three inactive teats and one long teat. Wallabies are very different than kangaroos. They're always smaller. Uh, they're often very pretty and have far more defined markings than your larger kangaroos. Their legs are shorter uh, and their forearms are strong and stocky. And the base of the tail starts much closer to the ground. They're really agile, makes them hard to catch, but that's what makes them great. Bye, Mum. It's great to identify mum and just see that she's happy and healthy. Now I want to have a look at a baby, make sure he's the same way. Young male yellowfoots are often bullied by older males. It's another reason why we need to monitor this guy closely. Hey, let go, please. Look at that. Beautiful little boy. That's what it's all about for us. He's two and a half kilos, one year old. Now he's going to get his own identity. The future for this guy is helping his species. Yellowfoot rock wallabies are endangered. Now, he can't breed here in this group because his parents are here, but there are a number of institutions that hold yellowfoot rock wallabies. We work together to keep the species safe in captivity. I can see Mum looking down at him, so I'm gonna let him go. He's gonna hop right back up. Hey, don't bite me, please. I'm about to let you go. See you next time. back in his cave, and Mum's just up on top. She's looking down now. Well, well done, guys. That's a real success. No worries, yeah. mate. It's good. Yeah. Let's hope we've got some more little ones in three months. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to leave you wrap up. Cool. See ya. This is Tasman Island just off the southeastern tip of Tasmania. A successful feral pest eradication project on the island has seen its bird population return to its natural state. There is another inhabitant on the island. No danger to the birds, they hang out down at sea level. Behind me is an Australian fur seal colony. Now they're one of the largest species of seals in the world. Now, there's a few young pups there, not too young, and mainly females, the big males that can get up to 360 kilos, they're off in the ocean somewhere. To get to that size takes a lot of eating. And when it comes to hunting, seals are the masters. And when a surge of water comes up, the seals will use that and jump into the water. And when they go under, they can hold their breath for five minutes. 
Now underwater, they are supreme hunters. Their whiskers are so sensitive. They pick up little electronic pulses left by fish as they swim through the water. They can go down 200 metres to catch their prey, which apart from fish, includes octopus and squid. But if you think it looks cold up here, it's nothing to the temperatures 200 metres down. But their bodies are well equipped. Now, the Australian fur seal has two layers of fur, and that's simply to help them stay insulated, to stay warm. Now, it's time to head out to the open ocean. Next stop, Antarctica. And if you're lucky, you might just get accompanied out to sea by a pod of dolphins. These are common dolphins, distinguished by that hourglass shape that runs the length of their body. They'll travel the oceans in groups that can number in the thousands, feeding on sardines, pilchards, anchovies and other small fish. This is the Southern Ocean at its best. Five minutes ago, it was sunny and calm. Now there's rain, wind, and big seas. And Tasman Island, where we were, is covered in cloud. There are so many seabirds out here. There's shy albatross flying everywhere. Shearwaters, there's sooty shearwaters, short-tailed shearwaters, fluttering shearwaters. There are little storm petrels. Now, whilst the birds go to land to breed, they spend the main part of their life at sea. Those albatross, though, they're just impressive. In the winter months, you'll get the royal albatross with one of the biggest wingspans of any bird on Earth. But the main one here is the shy albatross. They're so graceful the way they just fly above the surface of that water. They only breed on three islands, which are all around Tasmania. Numbers plummeted in the early 1900s due to demand from the feather trade. Although it's still under threat from long-line fishing, Shies can be seen scouring the seas right across the southern oceans. And today, numbers are on the rise. What a wonderful sight. He's definitely not in there. No, mate, there's... I can see three, not four. He's supposed to be in here. Mike has discovered that overnight, one of our koalas has gone AWOL. Yeah, I gotta tell you, mate, I always get worried when koalas are out. I mean, we got dingoes here, devils there. Let's have a look at this yard and then find him. OK, mate. We have 13 koalas here at the reptile park and sometimes they go missing. They don't vanish into thin air, but perhaps a keeper leaves a hose or a rake uh, up against the fence and the koala climbs out. Other times, they just get the desire to jump out. It's not easy, but it happens. Well, the yard's good. I mean, there's no obvious signs out, so it's something else, but you know our priority now. We've got a koala on the loose. Theo's on the loose. Yep, we've got to find him. Right, oh, let's get on. Come on, Theo, where are you, mate? Where are you, buddy? I'm really worried about Theo. Koalas, when they get out, they climb up a tree in a safe spot, go up across a limb into another tree, and they can come down be someone's lunch. What are you doing up there, mate? You haven't seen anyone about this big, fluffy, black nose? I hope not. Make sure you bark if you do. We've been out here for an hour now. I gotta tell you, I don't like this one bit. Theo, boy, Theo. What have you done? This is getting worrying. It's fast becoming a race against time. We'll look for Theo all day if we have to. He could be up really high in a tree, covered by leaves and foliage, and simply, we can't see him. If we have to, we'll stay here at night. I really hope it doesn't come to that. Come on, Theo, where are you, mate? We're now up to two hours, and my neck's becoming a bit sore. Where are you, boy? Where are you? If we don't find him soon, I'm going to have to extend the search outside the park. Watch it, Tim. Go ahead. I've got CO. Ah, you little ripper. Good on you, mate. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is Theo's made his way right up into the top branches. And he will not want to come down. Well, you found him. Now we've got to get him down. The fun part. Yeah, I don't want him to get any higher. No, I don't want him any higher either. Theo, no more. The plan now is just to scale the tree, 
try and get myself up high enough that I can then use the pole. And the pole's got a plastic bag on the end that makes a bit of noise. Now you put that above the koala's head and hopefully it makes the koala come down. I'm coming up, Theo. That's it, mate. Come on. Oh, he's going up. The cheeky little fella, every move up the tree I make, he goes a bit higher. He's going up. The trouble is, the higher he goes, the further there is for both of us to fall. Come on, pal. He's going even further, lovely. I don't want to have to go to the top of that tree because it starts blowing in the wind then and it gets a bit scary. If he goes up too high, I can't follow. I have to pull back for my safety and for Theo's. If the branch gets too thin, it could bend and snap and he's going to come crashing down. No higher, Theo. Take a look at this. That's a king cobra. That's why they scare me. Australia has 10 out of 10 of the most venomous snakes in the world. The king cobra only ranks at number 17, but what it lacks in toxicity, it makes up for with sheer size. It's the largest venomous snake in the world. I've got one with an eye problem, and he's not happy. Called King of the Jungle, this five metre king cobra is one of the world's most dangerous snakes. He's also my least favourite patient. So this examination requires the master, the owner of the Australian Reptile Park, and my boss, John so, Weigel. What's the problem? Look at that right eye. He's got the skin stuck. Right. And so is it causing him some problems, or is he...? Look, he's been continually trying to get it off. He shed well otherwise, but he's been trying to get it off. And, you know, for the guys, he's been a bit worked up. OK, well, we can have a look. The king has a, a piece of skin stuck over his eye, or a retained spectacle. Uh, it happens from time to time with snakes. They shed their skin. In some cases, it gets stuck on. This particular snake is normally cool, calm and placid, but with that piece of skin stuck on his eye, he's a different animal. He's blind in one eye, and that makes him very dangerous for us and critical that the skin comes off. But before the scale can be removed, John has the dangerous task of catching the cobra. I'm going in. All right. I wouldn't say that he's, he's mad, he knows what he's doing, but he's crazy to the point of view that, look at the size of that thing. Picking up a king cobra is scary. There's no doubt about that. I'm painfully aware that if the snake has enough latitude, it can easily turn around and bite. And it will be a highly venomous bite. diversity of landscapes to be found in Tasmania. Apart from desert, it can pretty much replicate all that is found on the Australian mainland. There's dense subtropical greenery, lush fields that help feed a nation, mountain ranges that leave you in awe, and of course, it's surrounded by seas that are some of the most fertile on Earth. This is Narantapu National Park, and it's one of the best places to view wildlife on the island. and they call this place Tasmania's Serengeti, just like the Great Plains of Africa. But the park's important for so much more than just its grasslands. There's coastal heath, oceanfront, tidal mudflats, and a great diversity of species and habitats. Late afternoon is the best time to witness some of Australia's most iconic species. And you don't get a better view than this. There are three species of wombat. Down here in Tasmania, we've got the common wombat. A bit smaller than those found on the mainland, but just as impressive. Wombats are bulldozers of the bush. They dig elaborate burrows underground with those incredibly strong forearms. They're also equipped with a hard cartilage plate on the rump. Now, if I was a predator and I followed that wombat down the burrow, he would whack it up against the top of the burrow, try and crush my head and block his burrow. They're extremely territorial, but most of the aggression is limited to the breeding season. Most of the time, just like this fella here, when threatened, 
they'll scurry off to their burrow rather than stand and fight. And they sleep in them through the day and he's just coming out for a feed and they're herbivores, grazers, and they feed on these open grasslands. They'll sometimes head over to the thick scrub for a forage, but on the whole, they prefer young, tender grass shoots. And when it's dry, they'll dig down with those claws to get at the roots. Because their diet is nutritionally poor, they need to conserve as much energy as possible. One way is by having a low metabolism. It'll take up to two weeks for food to pass through the digestive system. That lets them extract the maximum amount of nutrients from their food. And they'll graze for anything up to eight hours a night. That's a lot of gnawing on grasses, which are abrasive to teeth. But not to worry, wombat's teeth never stop growing. Funnily enough, their closest living relative is a koala up in the tree. subspecies of the grey, and here on Tasmania they're known as forester kangaroos. In contrast to the mainland, numbers here are drastically lower than what they used to be. Severe culling was common practice up until 50 years ago, to the point that numbers were reduced to 15% of their previous levels. Today only small pockets exist in the northeastern and central regions of the island. Grey kangaroos are the second largest species of kangaroo in Australia. An adult male can stand taller than a man. Now, they generally live in a, in a mob. Now, that's a loose mob just behind me there. And there'll be one big buck. He'll be the dominant male. And he'll fight off any others that come near. Then there'll be a bunch of females and their joeys. Now, the females can actually have two joeys at once. One dependent joey that's left the pouch but still drinking milk, and another that's fused to the teat inside. Kangaroos have one of the most energy efficient and economical ways of getting around. They hop, and it's pretty unique in the animal kingdom. Now, what it means is they rely on elastic tendons rather than a lot of physical exertion to cover long distances. The faster they travel, the less energy they use. It may not be in cheetah territory, but a female Eastern Grey was recorded at a whopping 64 kilometres per hour. Usain Bolt, eat your heart out. Pretty high now. No higher, Theo. We've got a bit of a rescue situation going on here at the park. Come on, mate. Our boy Theo went AWOL from his enclosure and found himself up the top of a tree. Come on, Theo. Come on, mate. Down this way, please. That's a boy. And guess whose job it is to get up there and bring the little deserter back to base? Little bit more, buddy, that hand. Come on. Yeah, I know you're cranky, mate. Come on, Pally. <laughs> Theo's a man on a mission and he doesn't want to play ball. He's putting up a fight. So I'm trying to unhook one hand while he's grabbing on with the other. He's moving around the back of the tree. Then he starts to bite. It's not easy. Come on, pal. Come on, onto me, mate. Don't forget I'm up in the tree too, buddy. You got him? Yep. Trying to bite. Yeah, you happy? Yep. OK, mate, I'm coming down now. You might have to just give me a bit of coaching on the feet, hey? Yeah, no worries, mate. No stay there, stay there. Hey, 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 no, no tree. Good boy. Good boy, settle down, settle down. Theo's accepted that he's coming down and once he's on me, he settles. But I've got to get the two of us down safely. Do you think you can grab him, mate? Yeah, I can get him now. Please, that claw out of my back. Come on, Theo. Thank you. Come on, mate. Oh, gee, got me now. Oh. Okay, okay, shh, it's okay. Right, time to go back to your enclosure, matey. Well, he knows he's home, mate. He's having a good sniff. He does. What do you think he got out? Well, I got a suspicion, mate. Wouldn't be the first time. I reckon he's out looking for love. Ah, Theo. You little devil, out looking for the ladies. Tim's got a theory that Theo's gotten out because he's after a girl. Now, I'm personally happy to help out any of my little male buddies here. So, Theo, we're going to see what we can do for you. He's ready, mate. <laughs> He's been calling the whole way. Well, there's only one thing to do when you've got an amorous young koala on your hands. 
it's time for us to play matchmaker. Theo is a young male, prime of his life, three years old, and this will be his first introduction to a female peer. Now, he's a teenager, he got halfway here last night. That's probably what he was after, so it's a pretty exciting day. Hey, mate. Yeah, and he's been grunting, like koalas do, the whole way from the yard to here. The only question now is whether Cupid will be shooting arrows between Theo and our girl, Pia. I'm really excited for Theo. He's shown us all the signs, we've found a perfect match, and we're about to introduce them. The only thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is little Polly. I don't think what we're about to see is something appropriate at her tender age. Good girl, okay. come over here. You might not want to see this. Let's go, mate. Up you go. There you go, that's Pia. Be gentle. That's good. So, oh, no, he's still missing. Lift up a little. Lift her up. There we go. That's it, good boy. Just needed a little bit of help. Excellent. Successful mating, mate. Very successful. She's nice and quiet too, very easy, perfect timing. Oh, the Polly hasn't seen a thing. Good. No, she hasn't seen a thing. It's OK, darling. Look at the eucalyptus trees out there. That's it, she's finished. That was good. That was unreal. Excellent. That's the most perfect mating you could hope for. Wow, Theo. Uh, for a first mating, that was brilliant. He showed all the trademark skills that we want to see in a young adult male koala. Should be pretty impressed with himself. Hopefully, Pia will give birth to another little Joey in five weeks' time. As for our Theo, well, he seems pretty impressed with his efforts. Go on, give us a roar. Give us a roar. Go. Yeah, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. What a day. Our little boy's a man. Theo, Theo, Theo. Okay. Just watch your legs. I'm about to come face to face with one of the world's most dangerous snakes, the King Cobra. If Master Handler, John Weigel, can catch it. The biggest problem is that there's so much snake here to work with in such a small area. OK. After several attempts, John's finally pinned down the cantankerous cobra. So I need some help before he wraps around. Now, a nice little safe early move might be to see if we can get him to expand some of that venom. Oh, look at that. Holy moly. If somebody does get bitten, there's going to be a lot less venom that's put in than before he was milked. So now it's actually time to get that uh, stuck eyelid off. How's that? Can you see him? Yep, that's good. So there it is. Oh, sorry, buddy. It's going to feel better in a minute. Got it, hey? Oh, wow. Look at that. Imagine that stuck over your eye. I've now removed the scale, but I suspect that the cobra may have another piece of skin covering his eye. I think there's one more. The eye's very opaque. Here we go. Look at that. Wow, you're right. Two. Wow. <laughs> hey. That's nuts. It's pretty rare that we'd get one piece of skin stuck on the eye. This time we had two. Yep, we got it, mate. Let's get out. Yeah, I think you did well. Now comes the risky part. Releasing this cranky cobra without getting bitten. Okay, we're ready with the door, guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no hard feelings, mate. Nothing behind you. Big snake. Big snake. Yeah. Look at that. Golly. <sighs> How many bodies in there? Certainly enough to kill a small army. So yeah. uh, better in there than in your arm, I think. Today went very well. We have a successful operation in that the spectacles are removed. So uh, I, I feel very good about today's outcome. I'm happy with the end result. And you know, John might still be the master, but the king is still the king.
This is Narantapu, one of Tasmania's many national parks. One of my passions is birds, and this estuary and sand flats are so important for so many species. Just here, I've seen pied and sooty oyster catchers, red cat plovers, and a particular favourite of mine. These two very special little birds are hooded plovers, right in front of me. Now, they're endangered throughout most of Australia. The problem? Well, there's a few. But one I keep returning to is feral pests. The adult birds, they can get away. But a long incubation period and the fact chicks are flightless for three weeks means that for nearly two months, they are at the mercy of these pests. An added problem is the breeding season coincides with the holiday season. The eggs are so well camouflaged, even up close it's difficult to see them. So anyone unaware wandering along the beach could easily step on a nest. So the plover's breeding success is determined by predation from feral pests and larger birds, disturbance from dogs, horses and humans. And added to that, high seas can wash away nests, eggs and chicks. It's no wonder numbers are plummeting across Australia. If we're not careful, we could lose the lot. On the way out of Narantapu, it's got one final little surprise for me. Australia has some of the most unique wildlife on Earth, and the echidna has to be one of the best examples. This is an egg-laying mammal. Can you believe that? Now, echidnas are monotremes, and there's only three species of monotremes on Earth. There's the short-beaked echidna, found in Australia, the long-beaked echidna, found in Papua New Guinea, and the platypus. The echidna spines are perfect protection against any predator, be it a dingo, goanna, big python or an eagle. Nothing can get through that wall of spines. Their little legs and arms, they are so strong, they're able to dig into the ground and just wedge in and throw those spikes up. But they also use them for finding food. Now they mainly eat ant eggs, termites, and they use these sharp claws to dig in, rip parts of a termite mound open or into an ant's nest and actually use their tongue that's 20 centimetres long to lick through the little cavities and collect all of the eggs or ants, bring them back into the mouth. He's curled up in a ball. And the idea of that is to protect himself. He protects all the vital areas, the face, all the major organs, and the soft parts of his body. And he's protecting himself against any predators that might try and eat him. I'm gonna put him back down now. My hands have had just about all they can take. He's spiky. And what he's gonna do is use those strong arms and probably just dig himself right into the soil. He'll sit there until we're gone. Here you go, mate. Thank you. Tasmanian devils have been facing extinction since the discovery of devil facial tumour disease back in the mid-90s. Once infected, the disease signals the end for a devil. The worst thing about it is it's a long, lingering and painful death. On the upside, once the disease has run its course on Tasmania, that'll be it. The disease will be gone. I'm on my way back up to Devil Ark. It's our conservation breeding project, and it's in the high country of New South Wales. We're breeding a disease-free population of Tasmanian devils that we can one day put back in the wild in Tasmania. Along for the ride is a pair of devil joeys and an adult called Lara. She's been recuperating at the reptile park after sustaining a bit of an injury. It's a bit of a trek from the park up to Devil Art, but it gives me some time to reflect on just how far we've come with the project. We broke ground back in 2010 and opened the facility with 47 devils in 2011. After three breeding seasons, we're now up to 180 devils. It's quite some achievement. I'm here to cover for Drew the Keeper, who is heading off the hill on a training course. G'day, mate. Hey, how you going, Tim? Good, how are you? Good, good to see you. Yeah, you too. Drew has set a camera trap in a yard he thinks has a new mum. It's a female called Aggie. Devils usually give birth all around the same time, but Drew reckons Aggie's joey came late. That'd be amazing. Yeah, 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 fingers crossed. Well, that's a nice surprise this late in the year. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know. Business as usual otherwise? Yeah, business as usual. Watch out though, it's been um, pretty warm during the day. I saw a huge tiger snake uh, earlier in the week. So oh, I love that. Check this out. 
What do you got? Yeah, tiger, snake, devil, um, face to face, so. Gee, did that end well? It did, yeah, the snake went off, the devil went off, so, yeah, I think. Good. All's well that went well. Uh, all good, mate. Well, you need to get down off the hill anyway. I oh, will see yeah, you tomorrow. Cool. All right, catch Bye. you later. Catch you. See ya. Drew's given me some cameras to put into Lara's yard. She's the one that travelled with me from the park. I just hope she's accepted into the enclosure by the other devils. <coughs> and this is Lara's enclosure. It's enclosure four. It's late afternoon. Perfect time to put a devil back into this environment. She's had a bit of a trip up and a bit of an ordeal in general, so I hope she's in good spirit. Doesn't blame it all on me. Hey, 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 settle down. Settle down. There she go. There you go. That wasn't supposed to happen. I would have liked to have grabbed her and had a bit of a look. I know she's okay because I saw her at the reptile park, but she was keen and hopped off. That's a good sign. That's the second camera. The other one's over there. I've got them angled at that piece of rue on the ground. Now, Lara, like all the other devils, will be hungry. They'll come in tonight and feed. I'll get some photos, and what I want to see are good interactions to know that Lara's okay. All that's left now is to feed my mob. Henry and Devils means that wherever I go, they go. And they're used to my house and the reptile park, but tomorrow I've got something a little bit different in mind. Yeah, I do. for a minute. There's no such thing as a sleep in at Devil Art. Morning rounds start early and there's lots of ground to cover. Top of the agenda today is giving Mungo Boy and Scarlet their first taste of life on the mound. The Joeys are used to a lounge room or an office. But their life is going to be here at Devil Ark and they need to know what it's like in the wild. So I've got a small pen today. It's a bit of an introduction. It's a safe one, but it'll introduce them to things a little bit more natural. This is a good little enclosure. It's got the native grasses, some logs to climb on, rocks, nest boxes. You're going to love it in here today. There you go. Oh, you're all right, aren't you? Come on, you've got to have a look around. <laughs> Wait and I'll get your brother. Here you go, little man. Here you go. You two, get up to mischief. Go on. <laughs> You're all right. That's Scarlet. Not quite as sure as Mungo Boy. You'd normally expect the female to be the bold devil. She'd be the one out having a look around, but Little Mungo man has taken off. Here you go. You stay here with your brother, please. Oh, she's coming. See you a bit later. You'll be all right. Mungo boy, come and get your sister. Second job of the day is an important one. It's the perimeter check. Now we drive it daily just in case there's been a tree down or a breach, and we also set traps. Thankfully, we've never caught a devil in one, but they're the backup system. Hello, Cheeky. Keep on going. Go on. Walking the enclosures, evidence of the devil's natural behaviours is jumping out all around me. And you can't get much better than a latrine site. Take a look at this. 
This is where all the devils in this yard go to the toilet here and it's a communication highway. Now what that means is devils will normally come here by themselves one at a time. They'll normally leave a poo sample and then they'll scent mark. And that's basically dragging their backside along the ground. They've got some scent glands down there. You can see a perfect one here. Another slide almost looks like a wallaby's tail or a snake track. That's a devil. And what I'm really happy about is these samples. And we've got three different poo samples there. One is full of fur. One is white. That means this devil ate a lot of bone. And one's black which means that this was a lot of meat. Now that's what I want to see because the diet we give them, they're supposed to have some roughage, like the fur and bone, and then just a good feed of meat. That's perfect. Yesterday, Drew told me he'd seen Aggie and thought she was carrying joeys. We usually know about new additions to Devil Ark, but these joeys passed us by. That's the camera. That means this is Aggie's burrow. This is where Drew saw her with a big pouch and thinks she's got joeys. I don't know how we missed her earlier in the year, but it'd be nice if we did and she's got joeys. It makes sense to me. The females always prefer wombat burrows, old, vacated wombat burrows, for maternal dens. You know, they go deep, lots of chambers. That means the joeys are safe, the female can defend it. That's great to see. And Aggie's not gonna come out, neither are her joeys. I can't wait to see what Drew's got on that camera trap last night. Snake. Tiger snake. Look at that. Common up here. That's a big one. And that's a devil pen. Right there. That's what we don't want. That's a bad mix. That's the fourth most toxic land snake in the world. I Means it's pretty dangerous. Certainly capable of killing me. And my main worry is these devils. That's a devil pen, there's a devil, right there. And the devil's not afraid to grab this and try and eat it. I don't want that to happen, so I'm not gonna take it too far away, but I got a creek that I wanna take him to and let him go. That's it. All right. that there for a sec. Pop that snake in. Now you don't want to touch the edges. People get bitten through bags, they think it's safe, but the snake can bite through it too. All right, now I'm happy. A bit of cord. Here he is. That's the snake's head right there. People make the mistake sometimes of thinking snake's in the bag. Everything's safe, but it's not. If you put your hand on that bag, snake's able to bite through it. Tiger snake's fangs are only a couple of millimetres, but you always got to be safe. I got a creek close by. That's good for tiger snakes. They love frogs, good habitat. Better than here with the devils. I'm gonna take him there and let him go. protects the devils and the snakes. It also makes our job safer. This is a good spot. A creek means frogs, makes food for tiger snakes. Good habitat. Right. This is the spot. We've got three venomous snakes up here in Barrington Tops. The tiger snake, the red belly black snake and the copperhead snake. Now I've seen devils eat two of them and I got a feeling that devils like some other species, honey badgers, wolverines, might have a bit of an immunity and can tolerate it. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Okay, there he is. Off you go, mate. Out of harm's way, just the way it should be.
just come up from the morning rounds and I've brought with me the camera cards. Now these were set overnight and we put one in Aggie's yard and one in Lara's yard. Now the first one I've got to look at is Aggie. I want to know if what Drew thinks he saw, a big pouch, is Joey's and we can catch it on here. Now the thing about Aggie, she's a genetically important female. So I'm really excited about this. All right, so it's daylight here in the first image and there's no Aggie. Okay, here she is. So it's almost 7 p.m. now. Aggie by herself. One, two, three, four joeys and Aggie. Now the joeys are good size, like, like a full grown guinea pig type size. That is brilliant. That's pretty amazing to see. And you know, because of the, the way it is up here, it feels like I'm looking at wild devils. Poor old mum's just sitting there trying to deal with four joeys and she looks a bit uh, exhausted. All of our devils are important that they breed, but there are devils that are more genetically important, and that may be because the area they came from in the wild, their, their, their origins are now non-existent. The disease has wiped them out. It may be because Aggie is one of a very few um, of her relatives within this program, and that means that we must represent those genetics or they're lost. So it's a really big and important achievement that she's bred. And to top it off, Lara looks like she's been welcomed back into the group with open arms. I'm really happy with what I've seen here. Lara's there feeding with another couple of devils, and that's as much as I could have hoped for. We take every opportunity to check up on the yards and their inhabitants. Putting out the feed is a great time. The early risers are out, and there's more often than not someone with a few words to say. This little fella's named Scooter, and he was hand-reared last year, so he's a bit friendlier than most devils here. But he's turning back into a wild devil now, and while he's out, he's still pretty nocturnal, and I certainly wouldn't be picking him up. Hey, you, you are a good boy. You're a good boy. That's about as close as I'd like to get to him. Hey, oh, look at those teeth. Everyone thinks that's a yawn, but it's not. That's him saying, whoa, you come any closer there, Timbo, I'm gonna nail ya. Yeah, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Come on, let's have some food. Come with me, mate. Here you go. Food's weighed up into portions, about half a kilo, 500 grams per devil, and it depends on how many devils are in the yard. We put it on a stake like this and leave it there with a bit of cord. That means in the morning we can come back and see if it was all eaten or some was left over and remove any scraps. If there's anything left over, we know we've got a problem on our hands. There's not a scrap of meat left unless there's a reason. Devils are the ultimate scavengers and will take any opportunity to grab a feed. Hey, come back here. Hey, that's not for you. Not yet, buddy. Thank you. See what I mean? <laughs> Cheeky fella. The devils have got one of the strongest jaws on earth for their size. And this is a pretty good example of it. This was the pelvis bone of a cow. And they've actually chewed not only through that into the marrow, but they've demolished the bone. Look at it. Strong jaws. That's nine yards done. Each one has a starve day once a week. Remember, we want wild behaviours. And these guys wouldn't get lucky out hunting every day if they were in the wild. That's as good as it gets. And as close to wild behaviours as you would ever see. We've got a social group of devils. You know, they're supposed to be these aggressive, drooling monsters. But look, you know, that's peace and tranquility right there, feeding together cooperatively. They actually help each other pull bits and pieces off that meat. They couldn't do it alone. It's tough. <laughs> Interactions like that are normal. What you'll see is they'll look fierce, really vocal, loud noises, but no one gets hurt. 
and devils use their little hands to eat. And the way their mouth works is they've got canines at the front. They'll sink them into the meat, pull a bit back, and then they've got scissor-like teeth that actually cut it off so they can swallow it. I'm gonna leave them be, let them get on with their feed. Knowing Aggie could be with Joey's is a real bonus for us. She's a genetically important femur, and it's important we see her family line thrive. The only way to catch Aggie, or any of the devils, is with these traps. This is a pretty wild environment, so it's not like you can just walk in and pick a devil up. I'll find a good spot and just wedge it in. And the trap itself is small, and it's meant to be. It stops the devil from becoming exposed overnight because it can get quite cool here. And it's pretty simple. There's a pin here that drops through the front, attaches to a piece of string, and there's a bit of meat inside. So the devil goes in, bites onto the meat, and sets the trap off. Aggie's the main objective, of course, but this will give us the opportunity to give all the devils we trap their preventative treatments. That's the last trap. I've set 12 traps. That might seem funny because there's only eight devils in here. But the thing is that devils are clever, cheeky, and little terrors at times, and you can get one devil that goes along and sets off a few traps before he's actually captured. So 12 traps will fix that. The devils are fed and the traps are set. It's been a long day. And just as they're waking up, I'm ready to crash. Always get a good night's sleep up here. It must be something about the clean, fresh air. One thing you can always count on is an early start. After the perimeter check, it's straight to Aggie's yard. Hopefully one of these is Aggie. Drew saw her with a full pouch. We've captured her on camera playing with Joey's. What we need to see now is that she's producing milk and that's everything we need to confirm she's a mum. Looks like a female. Right. Thankfully, Drew's back up on the hill. This is no job for just one man. There you go. Got him? Yep. <laughs> Big girl. Now that's not Aggie, this is Pippa. These treatments are normally used for cats and dogs, but they work for devils and they're preventative treatments against the likes of fleas, ticks, anything like that, uh, or internal worms. So it's a good opportunity to treat them even though we're trying to get Aggie. We'll capitalize on that and make sure these guys are healthy. It's just a topical, so we want it on the skin. Off you go, darling. Ah, uh, that's what we wanted to see. <laughs> that's just lovely. Lovely. Thank you, sweetheart. I can see you're a mum there, but I don't like that very much. Yeah, good morning. Do you want to take a chip there, please? Yep, that's her. Good. Taggy. Hello. We've been looking for you. Look at this. Now, the reason you can hold a devil by its tail is because it's strong. It goes all the way through the spine and down to the neck. Otherwise, we'd have to physically restrain her or put her under chemical restraint. I don't want to do that. This is a quick and easy process. But look at that. That's the teat that's in use of a female. Now, we've got one, two, three, four joeys. That's a full pouch. There's only four teats. Best result possible. Not only is it a nice surprise that we found Aggie with Joey so late in the season, but remember, she's one of the most genetically important devils within the program. So this makes it really special. Time for me to get back to the reptile park. Always a pleasure coming up here despite the hard yakka. These devils are something else, and it makes me proud to be a part of keeping them for others to see for generations to come. You ready? Oh, yeah. There he is, mate. He's looking at you. I'm entering the danger zone with Reptile Park Keeper, Kyle. You think? He's going to come straight up. Come on, El. 
we need to examine our 500 kilogram saltwater crocodile, Elvis. Kyle reckons something's up with his foot. So I was out here this morning, Tim, and he just wasn't acting like himself. He just seems really sooky. He was sitting on the bottom of the pool, just not being Elvis, where he's the, the, uh, explosive. Chasing you out of the yard. Yeah, pretty much. A few weeks back, Elvis lost a toenail. Now, it mightn't sound bad, but with a croc, that nail goes right back into the bone. Now, my aim now is to get him out, have a look at that toe, and just see if that's what the problem is. Come on, Al. But luring this five-metre killing machine out of the water is a dangerous mission. Oh. Elvis is a scary character. He was captured in Darwin Harbour attacking fishing boats. That's when you know you've got a true bull croc. From there, he was taken to a croc farm where he ate his girlfriends. Wasn't any good there. That's how he found his way here with us at the reptile park. If he wasn't known enough before, this big boy certainly enhanced his reputation worldwide recently when he killed a lawnmower. Yep, you heard me right. A keeper got too close while mowing his yard, and that was that. Not the tastiest of morsels, but he sure showed us who's boss. If you go within Elvis's strike zone, he is going to grab you. You never, ever, ever take your eye off him. I think what needs to happen is a bit of food. Let's bring him up and see what his attitude's like. Even though Elvis is the most lethal predator at the Australian Reptile Park... Come on, mate. Quite literally, overnight, this five-metre salty has turned into, well, a bit of a sook. Come on, mate. That's a boy. Come on. Come on, pal. Jump up, please. Okay, now he's not putting a lot of weight on that back foot, mate. Now I can see that. You can see it's sore. I mean, there's no nail on there, so the nail's gone. So when a nail comes off, that's going to be tender. What we're left with is raw tissue and nerve. And on a crocodile, that's the perfect place for an infection to start. That's a big problem. I'm worried, and it's justified. This has happened once before, and his toe swirled up, looked like a sausage roll. I can't let that happen again. There's only one thing for it. Australia surely has one of the most unique collections of animals to be found anywhere in the world. I'm on my way to find a particular species of flightless bird that's become synonymous with this area. This is tropical North Queensland, and this particular section is called the Cassowary Coast. It's where the rainforest meets the ocean, and as the name suggests, it's home to cassowaries. Three species of cassowary exist, but only the southern or double wattled cassowary is found in Australia. The first birds appeared on Earth 150 million years ago in the late Jurassic and cassowary fossils that date back 5.2 million years have been found. They are living descendants of the dinosaurs. They've been having a hard time of it of late. The usual reasons, loss of habitat, introduced species, but one of the saddest impacts on numbers is us feeding them. Once cassowaries start associating people with food, they start wandering through neighbourhoods and their chance of being killed by cars or even dogs goes through the roof. Various groups up and down the North Queensland coast are trying to help the cassowary's cause. G'day. G'day. Nice to see you again. I'm at the Cassowary Rehabilitation Centre to meet an organisation dedicated to protecting rainforests. Jennifer is one of the directors. So tell me, what exactly is Rainforest Rescue? Rainforest Rescue is an organisation that um, aims to protect rainforests all around the world forever. Yep. So it's really making sure that intergenerational people can enjoy it for the rest of eternity. Working alongside Jennifer is Graham, who's a local vet. Right, so this is the young fella in here. Oh, there he is. Yeah. He's, uh, he's fairly standoffish. He won't come near you because he's, he's, he certainly is. He's, we're trying to keep him as wild as we can. OK, and how old's he? Uh, so he's just over a year old. He came in as, as a young orphan chick, uh, about a month old. He's almost to the point where he can be released, where he can fend for himself. The first thing I notice in here is that it just looks like a piece of the natural habitat fenced in. It's big open space. Sure. Is sure. that the intention? That's what we try and do. I mean, this is not a public uh, display facility at all. We really try and, and make it uh, so they've got lots of places to hide, lots yeah. of places to get out of, the, out of the sun or out of the rain. The idea is to retain as many wild behaviours as they possibly can. This rescue centre is critical. There are a thousand, maybe less, cassowaries left in the wild. So every single cassowary is important. 
And the rescue centre means that a chick like this can be saved. All right, well, let's leave him. That was great. See you, matey. All right, Tim, well, this is probably a great opportunity to go and meet a friend of mine as well. Oh, good. OK. Thank you, mate. Thank you. No worries. Good on you for the work you do. That's fine. Yeah. Thank See you. you later. See you, Graham. See ya. Cassowaries are one of those rare species where the father raises the young. Once the female has laid her eggs, she'll go off and find another partner to mate with, leaving the male to incubate the eggs and raise and protect his brood. The trouble is, even he is no match for modern day intrusions, especially the motor car. Survival of this magnificent bird is dependent on people being made aware of their plight and adjusting their habits accordingly. Western Bowerbird, found in central and northwestern Australia. They're from a family of birds that has intrigued man for generations. As with so many species in the bird world, it's the male that provides the colour and display to kickstart a relationship. But unlike other birds, it's not his plumage that attracts females. Instead, the Western Bower uses a unique form of artistry to attract a mate. They are the ultimate builders. Able to construct intricate masterpieces to ensure they are the dominant male in the area. What he lacks in feathered decoration, he more than makes up for with his spectacular bower. He's just flown off. That gives me a couple of minutes to give you a really close look at this. And that is just impressive. Have a look at what he's got. Everything's the colour of old bones, which that is. But he's got glass, lids, someone's jewellery, decorating that bower. But you've got to love him because inside here are his most favoured jewels. And he's got what looks like a little pre-developed orange, a seed, and best of all, a rock from someone's garden. That's artificial, coloured. They're his finest jewels right in the middle. Every single piece here is selected because it's perfect for this bower. A stick on the outside here was thrown there because it's not suitable for the bower. It may have deteriorated, snapped. He's obviously brought it here, but the pieces up in that bower are perfect. And it's sole aim to impress females, of course. And they're pretty picky, these girls. They're gonna come here and assess his jewels to find work within his bower and then they'll decide if he's worthy of mating with them, worthy of siring their offspring. This guy has held the title of dominant male around these parts for four years. Before then, he would have been one amongst a group of teenage bowers, hanging around and learning from the former holder of the title. Things like how to build the bower, what sort of jewels to collect, that sort of thing. This fella was the smartest though. He took all he learned knowing it would come in useful sometime down the line. When the older bird's time was up, he was waiting in the wings and the ladies transferred their allegiance. Since then, his days have been spent constantly attending to the upkeep of his bower. He's got to be careful though. Four years is a long time at the top and there's a bunch of teenagers in the area, one of which is no doubt biding his time, waiting for his chance. I'm going to be a little bit naughty and I'm going to move one or two of these, not far, but this will certainly get his attention. Yep. He's back. I thought he might have collected something, but he didn't bring anything back, so he's probably just had a feed. As I thought, moving a few pieces has sent him into a frantic tidying streak. And he's fixing the bowers, the pieces that I moved. That's amazing. His little mind has gone into overdrive. He has to fix the bower. Because what if a female comes along? He's got to be ready at all times. It's amazing that he's so tolerant of me. I'm no threat to him, so he's not necessarily worried. But he's just driven to work on that bower. And that overrides my presence. Now to me, he looks fantastic. But in the scheme of things, he isn't the most striking of birds. There's a bit of a general rule with male bower birds. The less impressive his plumage, the more work goes into the bower. So long as this fella has the most impressive bower in the neighbourhood, 
he should attract a steady stream of females that will mate with him, then depart to raise her young. Males don't have any part to play in rearing chicks. They simply continue with their interior decoration. He's put all those ornaments right back where they were. I've seen bowerbirds, but never like that. That was amazing. The question is, will it be enough to reel in the ladies? I'm interested to see what Elvis is going to be like. He goes for lawn mowers, whippersnippers. I don't think he's going to be happy when he feels this. Our cranky croc Elvis needs a broad spectrum antibiotic for his toe, which is at risk of serious infection. So the plan is now that I'm going to lure him around into the right spot. He's actually going to think that he's going to get fed. I need to bring him in side on so I can hit him right in the side of the neck. I don't want to miss, the needle is massive and it needs to be to penetrate through that thick skin. When the time's right, bang. Everyone right, Kyle? Yep. yep. Okay, get ready, mate. One, two. <sighs> Got him. Got him. Whew. Okay, that was good. Right in. Bent the syringe head a bit. That's perfect. Now he's down. Got the whole lot in. The antibiotic should ensure that Elvis's toe heals without any complications. So that's one problem fixed, but we've got another. How did he do it? There's a rubber seal within the pool. Now that's the logical spot that he's caught his toe, the body's kept going, it's caught, and the nails come off. Now he's fired up from that big injection. I've got to jump into the pool and fix the seal. Now if that sounds a bit mad, you're probably right. But the job just has to be done. Kyle's going to look after the croc. Lizzie's going to hold a bit of rope around my waist. And the signal is if the croc comes, tug the rope. I'm out of that water quicker than you can blink, believe me. And you're going to talk to Lizzie? Yep. Anything at all, you just tell Lizzie, he's coming, Lizzie. Even if he looks my way. Let Liz know. Even if he's not looking my way, but he moves a little bit. Let Liz know. Still tell Lizzie. Yeah, no problem, Sam. Come on, Elvis. Before I go in, Kyle's got to make sure Elvis is suitably occupied at the other end of the pool. We good over there, Kyle? All good, Jim. So, Lizzie, if he comes, give me a yank. I've only got seconds in the water. Elvis can be quick if he wants to and I'll have no chance if my team isn't fully on alert. Thankfully, I have the best team around. Crocs are prehistoric killing machines. They've got a mouthful of teeth. They can grab onto something as big as a buffalo and they've got jaw pressure enough to crush its skull. So long as my dive buddies are keeping a constant watch, I'll be fine. He knows I'm in the pool. Time to speed things up. There's always that chance that he could grab you, so you've got to be careful. Always keep your eyes on the croc. Just have one last bit. If anyone says they're not scared of him, they're in the wrong place. That's it. That's good. Job's done. Elvis has his medicine, the pool's fixed, and I tell you, there's nothing like sharing the water with a five metre saltwater crocodile that just wants to eat you. I'm in Queensland on the Cassowary coast to meet a champion of one of Australia's flightless birds. Hello, Tim. Welcome to Michigan. Liz Galley has been campaigning on behalf of cassowaries for decades. First thing I want to know is how cassowaries are faring at Mission Beach. Well, as we know, you know, everyone loves Mission Beach, um, yes. cassowaries and people. So we've got development happening at Mission Beach, mm. and of course roads going through the cassowary habitat yeah. and fences. And Jen, that's where you come in from a, a broader sense that we've got Liz and people like Liz with, with local knowledge and passion, and your role is, is as a big picture educator. Well, that's definitely the intention. I think what we're trying to do is ensure that the whole of Australia is going to fall in love with this iconic species and bring to life that the cassowaries are a keystone species to the Australian forest, yeah. and without them, there will be no rainforest. Yeah. 
And cassowaries have got the pressure of people, dogs, cars, roads, some clearing of habitat. But you get big cyclones here and there are natural pressures. And what's it like after a cyclone? You can imagine, uh, there are a lot of trees come down in a cyclone, yes. so getting around the countryside is not that easy. It's quite interesting watching them come back and just check out their neighbourhood. They stand and they look yes. and they, they come across obstacles, but it doesn't take them long before they find those tunnels and they can get moving yes. around. And Will you show me? Sure. Yeah, let's go. OK, good. Walking through Liz's property, she points to a whole host of plant species reliant on the cassowary. Native olives, nutmeg, ginger and various fruits and berries. There's a cassowary dropping and it's full of seeds and nuts. There's about 150 species of rainforest plant that are germinated by the cassowary. 70 of those species rely on the cassowary. Their only way of germinating is to be eaten by a cassowary, go through the digestive system and come out like this in a little package of fertiliser. This cluster of saplings would have been a cassowary dropping. Now it's laid there on top of the leaf litter and these saplings are all in this dappled light just trying to get up to get big enough to get a spot in the canopy. So plenty of evidence around the property of cassowaries, but what I really want to see is their tracks through the forest. Yep. You probably won't be able to see, but you can, you can see oh, that this is yeah, obvious, no, a, obviously a pathway that's going yeah. into the bush here. I, I checked it out yesterday. I thought you might like to go for a sure. walk. Sure. OK, let's go and have a quick look. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I see. Oh, and down to the water. That's beautiful. It's, it's tight compared to, well, us clumsily lumping through here. You can see the cassowary's head down and it's a tight little passage. Yeah. Just imagine, though, if it wasn't for the cassowary's digestive system, which is full of enzymes that help protect them from harmful toxins, this forest would be completely different. We've just followed a cassowary track down the hill sideways. It doesn't go straight down, it wiggles side to side. And we've come down here to a creek and they're never far from water. They're a big bird, it's hot, they need to drink. And when they do, they drop the head down to a, a pool like this, put that bottom bill in and scoop up a big mouthful of water. That's beautiful. Okay. Out on the road again. I'm a little disappointed not to have seen a cassowary on Liz's property, but that's wildlife. You can't set your watch by them. Just up the road is Eddie Bay, where I'm told cassowaries come out as regular as clockwork. This beautiful bird is Eddie. She's quite a character and always keeps the tourists entertained. Just as I think it couldn't get any better, Leaving the beach behind, I've come across these fellas. There's a male cassowary. How impressive is that? There's a common misconception that an encounter with a cassowary could be dangerous or somehow life-threatening. In fact, they're very peaceful and just go about their own business. Well, I've achieved my aim to see wild cassowaries in their own environment. Now it's up to us to make sure generations to come have the same opportunity. I've been hanging about with this western bowerbird for a few hours now. I've got to say, his efforts to attract a female has blown me away. But bowerbirds tend to hang about in clusters, so I've been looking about for other bowers. This is a second bower, and I found it about 100 metres from that beautiful big bower. Now, I know that that first bower is the dominant male of this area. And this bower is just on the outskirts of that territory. But any female that comes along will not choose the male, there he is right there, will not choose the male that owns this bower. In fact, there are a number of younger birds that will lay claim to it. And teenage bowerbirds, they have to learn the dance. They have to learn the art of displaying a wonderful bower. And they learn that from a dominant male. So this is a training ground. Somewhere the teenagers can practice what they've learned from our other fella. But that dominant male, he's a wily old boy. For as long as he can, he'll defend his position. And that means every time these fellas start building what he perceives to be a threat, he'll come in and destroy the joint. Eventually, as sure as night follows day, 
one of these fellas will seize the opportunity, muscle in and take over the mantle of Top Bird. I've been waiting around for a female to appear for ages now, and I'm starting to wonder if our fella here is losing his mojo. Hang on, I think I've found the answer. Quick, 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 perenni. Base of that tree, there's a perenni. I could hear the miners going off. They're the alarm bells. They've told me there's danger around. Look at that, a perenni. About a metre and a half long. Biggest lizard in Australia. There he is, look at that. It's actually the second largest lizard in the world. And I found him because I walked away from that bowerbird's bower, give it a bit of space. And as I was leaving, I could hear some miners. And miners are a bird, very aggressive bird. And they will attack anything that's a threat to their chicks. And that's what they think this is. They were here swooping him, making a lot of noise. Now he's getting a bit cranky there now. You watch his tongue. All monitors have forked tongues, like a snake and that helps them find food. They flick it out and it enables them to tell which way the food is. But at the minute, he's just smelling if I'm okay. Hey, buddy. You know, depending on its size, a perennial will eat anything from insects, rats, and bigger ones have even been known to hunt small mammals and Australia's largest venomous snake, the King Brown. Wherever he goes, you know there'll be trouble. With that perennial me lurking about, it's no wonder our bowerbird was lonely all morning. Time to leave him be and let him get on with his business. What a morning, though. A bowerbird and a... Show me. When you're a bit bigger. There's two little rascals in my life who I couldn't do without. These are my boys, Billy and Matty. My boys are pretty lucky boys. If I'm not bringing something home from the reptile park, they're at the park playing. But today is Billy's first day with me at the reptile park and he's gonna help me do heaps of things, aren't you? Come on, let's go. Now? Yeah, now. <laughs> ah, come on, I gotta get the other Superman. Put your bag on now, buddy. And of course, there's always one or two other youngsters taking up residence at our place as well. One more, Pat. Okay, so see you, Mungo boy. And sometimes we take in others that need help. Let's get your snake. This is a green tree snake that was rescued from the neighbour's yard. It was bailed up by a dog, so I think I've got a safer spot for it than there. Meow. Here you go, buddy. Put that there, please. Give your mum a kiss. Yeah. Another one. <laughs> Love you. Come on. Sometimes the whole gang wants to come along. Yeah, he came when he's a bit bigger. <laughs> okay, come on, see you, darling. Bill's a hands-on guy, but some jobs are just too big for him at the moment. Right, pal. Thank you. Here you go. Ta, I'll put you in first and then I'll put them in. Ow. Sit down. I got so We're only a 10-minute drive from the reptile park, but little Bill's always on the lookout for hideaways of local critters. What kind of snakes, mate? Maybe diamond pins. Maybe tree snakes? Yeah, it looks and like a good. wombat? And a wombat? A wombat? Sing say? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really important that kids have early contact with animals. Whether it's a traditional pet like a dog or something more exotic, doesn't really matter. I know for me that my little boy Billy was he was pretty quiet. But animals brought him out of his shell and they gave him the opportunity to talk to other kids, for other kids to be interested in him. It helps them to be cooperative and sharing. It enhances their role-taking skills. And you know, at the end of the day, it helps them to understand other kids' feelings better. Do you think there's any dingoes around here? No, they've been in the middle of the night. Ah, oh, you don't see them in the daytime. No, because they hide. Bill's been to the park before, of course, but today we're going right behind the scenes. Before we even get inside, as always, Bill's got to check for tadpoles. Where are they? Where are they? I don't know. I can't see any today. Why? Come on, let's go in. I can see one over there. Where? I don't know whether he's kidding me sometimes or he's got a better eye than his dad. I don't know. I can't see one. 
I don't... Like to see one. Maybe there hasn't been any frogs here lately. Huh? No frogs. Come on, let's go in. G'day. How are you? The Reptile Park is glad to help the public where the welfare of wild animals is concerned. I'm Tim. Hi, Tim. I'm Natalie. In general, nice to meet you. we hear about orphan bruise and wombats, but today's call out is a little unusual. What do you think's in there? Well, they kind of make a squeaking noise. Rats, so bats, mice, birds. Maybe baby birdies, yeah. perhaps? No, let's go and have a look. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Come on, you gonna come? Come here, Mummy. Come on. Good girl. Natalie's been hearing strange sounds coming from inside her bedroom wall. She's hoping I can remove some mysterious squatters. It's a good spot because you've got the forest next door, so plenty of wildlife. Yeah. Where? Where are they? Where are they? They up here? Oh, right, so they're in here. But whatever's in the walls, it's making them move out of some of the rooms. They can't go in there, it's noisy. I need to find it. So, and you hear them from inside? Yep. Okay. And it just sounds like mummy birds brought back some food for the babies and they all start squeaking. If they were birds and it was mum and dad, you should see them coming and going pretty regularly and you haven't seen anything? I haven't seen anything, no. But if you could rehome them somewhere that's safe for them in a nice environment yep. that... We've got a cat. I don't want them to get eaten or anything like that, so... <laughs> So we know whatever it is, is most active at night, and it's probably nocturnal. Now, I've got a good hunch on what it's going to be, but whatever it is, I've got to get it out. Do you want to help me? Do you want to have a go? Do you want to have a go? <laughs> I think that was a no. These poor people, I, I come around to have a look at their animals, and I mentioned to them I'm not a builder, which is just as well because this house is coming down. There's your drain. Oh, lovely. Might be a good time to clean it. <laughs> oh, the gutters aren't bad. So someone's been good. That's my lovely dad. All right. I might start at this one, hey? Make sure no little mice or anything. Oh, I can see something there now. I've found them. They're not mice and they're not birds. Look up under there. Oh! <laughs> oh, you're cute. Okay, so I can see one. Oh yeah, I see him now. Oh, he's just there. As I thought, we've got a family of microbats living just up inside the cavity. Now he's behind this one, which is okay. So what we might actually do is now work at getting this top one off. He's about the size of a little mouse. But as long as he doesn't, he's gonna drop on me. <laughs> a little microbat, it's tucked right up the top. Geez, you're rougher than me. And for a little animal, they've got big teeth. Holy moly. Are there more? Oh, is there more? Have a look at this. Oh. There we go, so. Yeah, can you see now? Look at that. Oh, I can hear them. Oh, yeah, there's one. Oh, there's, there's, a, oh, there's a whole. Yep, a whole little colony somewhere. of them. The bats are going to have to come out. out the way. Oh, they're starting to wake up. And if they're not relocated, they could pose a threat to the family. Don't get me wrong, I love bats, but they can carry a virus called lysivirus, and it can be fatal to humans. It's a form of rabies. And for little Amber, who's at that age where she's poking around in places she probably shouldn't be, it's a real worry. We've got to be quick, because these little guys are starting to wake up. They're in there because it's dark. I've just given it daylight, and they're beginning to get active. So I've got to be careful and just get one at a time. Okay. I've got one. Oh, cool. Are they sitting? Yep. Yeah. Look at that. That's oh, it. So cute. Full grown. Look at that little face, full of teeth. Yes. I'm going to put them in the bag and go again. So there's one. They will climb up. That's it. Thank you. Okay, there's one, two. Look at that. Another two. Oh, mate, they're so fragile. Okay. So that's three. Come on, little guy, I don't want to hurt you. Okay, oh, he's a cranky one. Another two. He's awake. <laughs> Look at that. That's a pretty cute little face. Hey, it's all right, mate. Five. 
That's that number six. Oh. So far, I've managed to remove six bats. Oh, he's up high, that little guy. But there's still one left, and this fella doesn't want to go without a fight. Come on, little guy, I don't want to hurt you. I'm here at the Alice Springs Reptile Centre, but I'm not a visitor, and the centre doesn't just display reptiles. They provide a pretty serious service for the local community. They man the snake phone, and they might get call-outs for geckos, lizards, but sometimes it's venomous snakes. Let's go and say hello to Justin. What are you expecting today, mate? Uh, listen, it's been fairly warm lately, so more than likely you're gonna be venomous out at this time of the day. Whip snakes, uh, we've got western brown snakes, produce our mulga snakes from time to time. Okay, so what's the plan? What are we gonna do? We, we sit by the phone and what happens? Yeah, basically we just wait and you know, hopefully a phone call comes through for us and yes. we can take you out on a call out and uh, you know, a bit of luck we'll get an interesting character while you're in town. Yeah, good. I hope so. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Work never ends where keeping wildlife is concerned. So while we wait on our first call, there's plenty of jobs I can help Justin with. Hey, look at that chopper. Once the exhibits are cleaned, the water's been replaced and the reptiles are fed, there's not much else to do other than wait. Yeah. Multiples? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's me, mate. So, it could, could be us. us. Snake phone, Justin speaking. Justin gets around 350 call-outs a year. And not just from private homes. Snakes will find their way in anywhere. Shopping centres, schools, factories, even the hospital. All right. Thanks, mate. See ya. Snake? Yeah, no, this yeah, guy's just rung up and his wife's at home with the kids and a snake in the lounge. Let's go, hey? Let's sort it. Keeper in the making is by my side at the park today. It's my eldest son, Bill. Before we head out, I've got one or two things to sort out in the office. Yes. Say hello, Tina. Billy? Well, he's got some friends to see. Wave. Wave. Are you oh, he's telling you. Today? He's got a snake in his bag. <laughs> a snake? Go and show Tina the bag. Do you know what snake it is? It's tiny. A tree snake. A tree snake. Is yep. it a green one? Yep. Yeah? So you're going to go and release it now, the dad? <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> Why is it in the fishies? Let's go up to the bush, eh? Hey? I've got the perfect place out back to release the green tree snake. Thanks. Trouble is, my little apprentice wants to say hello to everyone he meets along the way. What is it? Over there, over there. Who is it? It's a chakra over there. He's a big one. Yeah. What is it? What do you got? I think that's something. Oh, yeah, it is a big one. Is it an alligator? That's right, mate. It is an alligator. Come on, up this way. And if it's not saying hello, he wants to take them oh, home right. as a pet. Because you can't have an alligator as a pet. Nico, how are you, mate? Hi. Give Nick a big five, Bill. How you going, buddy? Can I stay in Yeah, we'll come and have a look after. Come on. Is it looking good for the snake out here? Yeah. I think it is. Green tree snakes are harmless to humans. They can give you a bite if you annoy them, but their main interest is seeking out frogs, skinks, and other small reptiles and amphibians for food. Well, this looks like a good spot. I think this is a good spot. In the water? In the water and the trees. There you go, go across. Here you go. Do you know why this is a good spot? Uh, should there be a platypus in there? I don't think there's a platypus in there, mate. Why? Well, it's not big enough for a platypus. It's a good spot for a tree snake. Dad, you think can he's... you put him in the water? I can put him in the water. Is he a water one? Yeah, well, he's a tree snake, but he likes the water too. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. OK. Well, I'm going to get him out now. I don't want him in there. OK. OK, OK, you hold him. Uh, hold further down so you don't hurt him, mate. There you go, mate. Let him go. Good boy. He likes it. Wow. All right, we've got work to do, mister. Let's go. Wait for me. 
Yeah. Okay, mate. Come on, Superman. Ah! Finally, we can start work proper. But that will have to wait until next time when you can see Bill and I talking to the animals. Can you howl like a dingo? Oh! I'm on a house call. Something we get from time to time. This one involves a colony of bats. OK, a little bit more. Gotcha. Got him. Look at that. And look for their size. Look at the attitude they've got. Isn't that beautiful? It's like tissue paper. Yep. Stay here, matey. Not afraid to bite. Take it here. Listen. Hear that? With all the bats removed, I now need to find how the tiny trespassers got into Natalie's home. So this is a little bat highway. I can see right where they're coming in, straight through the side. And then you can see where they climb up, tiny little claw marks. And beneath that is a heap of droppings. If we block these holes, at least that means this particular access point's stopped. They're just sneaking through a couple of cracks. And now, it's important that I fix them. Uh, if I don't, more bats will come and use that site. That's not good for the bats, and it's not safe for the family. Are you supervising? All right. So this will work temporarily, and you guys might just need a tube of that gap filler. Sure. Good yeah, I'm glad we got them all. I'm going to take the bats back to the reptile park. I've blocked off their home. If I leave them there, they won't survive. I need to bring them back and give them the care they need. Jeez, it's pretty heavy, isn't it? It's heavy, yeah. You're a good helper. They can ride in the front with me. Bye bye, Dad. But Dad, back. Good girl. Bye. Hey, gone. 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 Hello, little guys. They're so small. Back at the park, they'll get the care and attention they need until I can find them a suitable home. Look at that. I can see here that they're not bent wing bats. So my thinking now is that we're at a chocolate waddled bat. Now I've identified them, it's time they get a new home. For the time being, anyway. Okay. Bats like to feel safe. They're little, they're vulnerable. They're a little snack pack for an owl or a kookaburra. So when they hide, they want to be compressed, they want to be tight. So the things that I've provided there allow them to either get right up inside a beanie, to get in a dark box and tuck away. He is so cranky. Look at that for a little guy. They, they sure pack a punch. Hey, I wouldn't like to be an insect. There you go, buddy. I'm going to go up in there with you, mate. Tucked up, safe and sound. I reckon it's time they got a housewarming present. What bat doesn't love a juicy mealworm? <laughs> Microbats are insectivorous. That means they eat little insects. Now, I've got a bowl of mealworms and they'll feast on that overnight. Now, I'm going to keep them here for a little while and eventually they'll go back to the wild. in Alice Springs with Justin from the local Reptile Centre. We're on duty covering the snake phone and have just received the first call out of the day. Alice is a pretty compact town, so it doesn't take long for whoever's on duty to get to the action. This is it, hey? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, let's grab some... Hello. Beer. Right, mate? Yeah, let's go. In most cases, Justin has no idea what he's going to come across, and this time's no different. The most common around these parts is a western brown, one of the world's most venomous snakes. Nadia has come outside with the baby boy, and that's understandable. But if you can, it's best to keep an eye on the snake from a safe distance. That way, there's no chance of them sneaking off, and the snake catcher can get the job done as quickly as possible. Oh, yeah, I see him. OK, there he is, mate. He's right there. Oh, look at that. OK. Oh, Mulga snake, mate. Mulga, hey? Yeah. Jeez, he looks a little different than the ones I'm used to. Yeah, the guys up here, mate, are awesome. 
I'm gonna move this out a tiny bit. Yeah, yep. Just sideways. That's it. Here he comes, right here. What is it? Oh, my steak, hey? Yeah, no, gorgeous and warms up. He's warm. Sit down, buddy. Right over in the bag. That's him. Drop him down, mate. Beautiful. All right. Awesome. Well, that was easy, considering there's a snake in the house. Yeah, 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 it's good. It's always nice to have a, an easy one for a change, mate. That's for certain. Even after all these years dealing with snakes, they still get my heart racing. There was a mulga. A mulga? Yeah, a king brown snake. So it's venomous? Yeah, he's only about number 20 in the world. Yeah. So, you know, on the lighter end of the scale for our Australian snakes. So, uh, yeah. Glad he's gone, hey? Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Welcome to Alice Springs, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Right, we'll, just, uh, we'll take this guy back to the centre first. So yes. we'll just double check over him and make sure he's okay. Yep. Um, dog in the backyard, just in case he has had a nip on the way past. Sure. And just assess him, make sure he's okay, and then we'll get him out this afternoon and uh, let him go, mate. Give him a new home. And, Good. Yeah, bit of luck. He gets okay. for a few more years, mate. Let's go. Oh, yeah, well, thanks again for the call. We'll go and find a new home for this guy. See you later. Thank you. Bye, little one. See ya. Was that the first snake? First snake. <laughs> See ya. Hopefully the last. <laughs> That was good, mate. Easy. Yeah, mulga snakes are good, mate. You should try that with a Western Brown. No, thanks. It's a good spot. Once the snake has had a check over, it's out into the bush. Release sites are carefully selected way out of town. The further away from people and cattle, the better. OK, let's go. Well, yep. yeah, mate, you right there. You can keep it up nice and high. Yep. OK. You got him? You got him, mate? Beauty. Beautiful, look at that. Look at him. All right, buddy. Off you go, pal. Off you go. Oh, other way, please. Other way, mate. Go. That was good, mate. It's a perfect habitat. Long way from where we collected him. He's no harm to anyone here.